A Cheringham Mystery, The Body in the Woods, written by Matthew Costello and Neil Richards, narrated by Neil Dudgeon. Prologue 1998 A Deadly Decision He stood up as the bus pulled into the main square of this small English village, his heart racing, so crazy, to do this thing, to come here, without telling anyone, but he had to. There was no way he could not do it. The sun was already setting as he got off the bus. An old couple looked at him as if they knew he wasn't from round here. Was it that obvious? So cold now in the open air, out of the heat of the bus. He wore a thin sweater, but with the sun gone, he could have used a real jacket. The cold only added to the chill he felt in coming here. So impulsive, his friends would say, he just doesn't think. But there was no way he could sit and wait and wonder, was it all really over, so exciting, so amazing, so thrilling, now nothing? He walked, aimlessly at first, down this alley, this lane, until he finally stood in the shadows. He felt alone. The weather was turning colder, so stupid not to bring warm clothes. So many things he should have thought about. But one thing he did bring, despite the risk, in a little side pocket of his backpack, the small plastic bag. A quick look to either end of this curving alleyway. He undid the zip lock. Then, another look down the curve of the alley, he slid a finger in. Just a taste. He brought the finger to his nose and inhaled the white powder vanishing from his fingertip. Then, that sweet rush. And he actually felt warmer. And this dark lane, not ominous at all. He could see things quite clearly. He refocused on his task. He turned and walked away from the shelter of the lane towards the lights and the shops and people of the village. He passed the pub. The angel, he read on a sign, with a figure of a beautiful angel hovering above the letters, already filled with people, so warm, so inviting, but no. Then he passed a run-down hotel. He looked at the faded sign by the gate, the bell. Across the road was a sign, the street map of the village. He hurried across the high street. He could just make out the words on the washed-out map by the light of a nearby street lamp. There. Yes, that was it for sure. He had to catch his breath. His heart began to race, only moments away. He took a deep breath and started walking again, away from the lights of the village, into the inky blackness. Part 1 The Body Chapter 1 A Perfect Morning This is the life, eh? said Ray Stroud, climbing down from the cab of Tom Vining's rusted pickup truck and taking in the view. Ahead of him, the long grass of the meadow spread all the way down to the river, dotted with poppies and wild flowers that shone red and blue in the morning sun. And even though it was barely eight o'clock, The air already felt warm. It was going to be another fantastic June day. And I'll be fifty quid richer by the end of it, he thought, already tasting that first pint of hooky ale down at the ploughman's. He reached back into the cab for his takeaway breakfast, still warm from the transport cafe out on the Cheringham Road. Carefully, he unwrapped the Megadeal sausage bacon and double-egg sandwich, 
and squirted a sachet of tomato ketchup deep into its greasy folds. He took a big bite, egg and butter oozing down his chin, looking back at Tom. Gonna be a scorcher, he said. Don't count on it, said Tom from inside the cab. My phone says it's going to rain this afternoon. Ray looked up and wiped his mouth with his sleeve. What the hell did phones know about the weather? Then he watched as a small convoy of vehicles appeared at the far side of the field and headed straight for them, bumping over the rough ground. It's the gaffer, he said. Might be, said Tom, climbing out of his cab and standing next to him. Might not be. Far as I can tell, we got two bosses on this job and neither of them knows his arse from his elbow. Ray carried on eating while he watched the vehicles line up in the corner of the field. Two cars, each with a single occupant, and a minibus packed with people and baggage. Not hard to work out who were the bosses and who were the workers. He watched as the drivers, carrying laptops and shoulder bags, got out of the cars and immediately huddled together, pulling out papers and pointing around the field. Meanwhile, the side doors of the minibus slid open and Ray saw the passengers pile out. Students, they looked like. A few skinny blokes with wispy beards, shorts and shiny new boots, but mostly bright-eyed girls in T-shirts and jeans, all carrying rucksacks, buckets and yellow hard hats. Having them flouncing around, nice perk of the job. Pretty obvious from here that those hands would all be soft and spotless. Two weeks digging up this field, he thought they're going to have skin bad as mine. Ray inspected his own hands, calloused, ingrained with dirt, nails torn and discoloured. Then he rolled up his empty breakfast wrapper and chucked it through the window of Tom's cab. He watched as the students dragged tents and boxes into the shade of the trees that lined one side of the meadow. Good place to make camp, he thought. Want to stay out of that sun today, all right? The two bosses exchanged a few words with the group, then headed over towards the truck and the trailer. Here we go, said Tom out of the side of his mouth. The men approached, and the taller of the two stuck his hand out towards Ray. Mr. Vining, he said, Professor Cresswell, Western University, Department of Archaeology, I believe we spoke on the phone. Ray didn't take the hand, but instead nodded towards Tom, who now stood next to him. I'm Vining, said Tom, not moving. Ray saw the man, his hand now hovering in mid-air, unshaken, look confused. Then Tom held out his hand and put him out of his misery. Ray smiled to himself. For as long as he had known Tom Vining, the digger driver had a gift for putting people off their stride, especially if they were in charge. Not a tactic that worked if you were rubbish at your job, but everybody knew that Tom was the best digger driver for miles, a specialist, an artist and always in demand. This is Ray, said Tom, nodding to him. My banksman? The professor looked confused at the word. He walks along, checking as I dig, digging with a shovel, just need good eyes and a strong back. Ah, yes, terrific, said Cresswell. Wonderful to have you on board, Ray. Uh, have you ever worked on a dig before? No, said Ray, but I've dug a lot of holes. He watched Cresswell adjust his glasses, clearly trying to work out if Ray was taking the piss. Then a sheepish smile. Oh, very funny, very funny, he said at last, and nodded to the man next to him who smiled back. Ray looked hard at the other man. He recognised him from the village. Right, that was it, leading groups of tourists round on the Cheringham History Tour. This is Will Goodchild, who'll be on site running the dig on my behalf. Will's our local Roman expert, isn't that right, Will? Ray saw Goodchild frown, as if he wasn't happy with that description, then smile awkwardly at Ray and Tom. The historian didn't seem to recognise him. No surprise there, thought Ray, him not exactly being a regular down at the Ploughman's. Yes, um, the university's in charge, of course, continued Cresswell. But as far as you're concerned, Will's your um, line manager. I shall be running things from the ivory tower. <laughs> Isn't that right, Will? Will shrugged, clearly finding it hard to smile at Cresswell.